So, four guys went out to dinner to brag about their sons. Abel, Brad, Charlie, and Dave. And just as they started, Dave had to go to the bathroom, so he disappeared. And Abel started, and he said, my son is so rich and powerful. He started off as a salesperson, and he worked long hours and worked hard, and then he entered his own company. And recently, he was, was so rich that he decided to give his best friend a brand new Mercedes. And then Brad said, well, that sounds pretty cool, but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you, my son's even more successful. He started off as a stockbroker. He worked long hours, learned all the ropes, learned all the mistakes. Now he owns his own company, and he gave his best friend a million dollars in stock. And then Charlie said, well, my guy beats all of you guys. I'm so proud of him. I raised him right. He's a real estate broker, and now he's so successful, he gave his best friend a house. And meanwhile, Dave comes back from the bathroom and says, hey, what have you guys been talking about? And they said, oh, we're just bragging about our sons. And Dave says, oh, man, I wish I could sit around and brag about my son. I, Ten years ago, he told me that he was going to become a hairdresser, and he became the best hairdresser ever. And I had high hopes for him, but then three years ago he came to me and he said, Dad, I, I've got HIV. And I was so disappointed and so disturbed and I didn't know what to do. And then last year he came to me and he said he had AIDS. <sighs> but you know, I try and look on the bright side. Recently he had a birthday party and all of his best friend lovers got together and one gave him a Mercedes, another gave him a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I looked long and hard to find something funny to say about this topic, and I'm glad that it came off well. Uh, when I, I had a math teacher in high school I really, really liked. He was a great teacher. He was teaching me calculus. And two or three years after I left, I found out he had died, which came as a shock to me. I didn't know that. And they told me that it was cancer, and I was a little bit more shocked because he was only about 50 years old. And because I went to a Jesuit school, they came to me and said, well, confidentially, Eric, um, you know, you, you should probably know since he wrote some recommendations for you and everything, he actually died of AIDS. And that was, that was really hard for me to, to handle. I mean, I, that was uh, personally very difficult for me. And so I'm trying to wrap myself around some recent news, and I'm working through some of these issues that I've seen in my life that have to do with these topics. And so I'm going to go ahead and present to you some research that I've done in trying to interpret these latest headlines. And one of the things that I have here is a little handout. Uh, go ahead. I usually in the past have given each and every one of you a handout, but most of you just hand them back at the end or throw them out. So this time I'm just going to save some time and <laughs> send around three. Two. And what this says is, I'd like to give you a little bit of understanding of what's going on, because a lot of people don't know the actual facts. And right now, across the world, there's 36.7 million people who have HIV. 36.7 million around the world. And around the world, there's a million people who die of AIDS. A million a year. Now, in the United States, that number, as you can see from this handout, is not 36.7 million. It's a million 122,000. So 1,122,000 of our fellow Americans are living with HIV. And unfortunately, one-seventh of them don't even know it. They could be infected, they don't know it, which means they can continue to pass it, because if they're not being treated, they can continue to pass it to all of their sexual partners. Now, in the year 2010, there was 41,000 people a year who were being diagnosed with HIV. We've actually knocked that down from 2010 to 2015 to 38,500. So we had some progress from 41,000 to 385, but now it's going back up. It's now up to 39,782. 67% of those diagnosed with HIV are gay or bisexual men. 33% are women, usually drug users who share needles. 
50% of those who get HIV or AIDS are homosexual, about 25% are bisexual, and 25% are drug users. In the year 2016, 18,160 people were diagnosed with AIDS, with AIDS, not HIV. And since the 1980s, over 1.2 million people in the U.S. have been diagnosed with AIDS. Now, 19,000 of those each year die of AIDS. So let's put that in comparison. 19,000 people die of AIDS, about double that number get HIV. The number of people who died in traffic deaths is 37,461. So as many people who are dying in traffic deaths are getting HIV, and about half as many of those are dying of AIDS. Now you guys can turn on the TV and you can see advertisements against drunk driving. You can see people who are telling you don't drink and drive, don't drink more than one alcoholic beverage every hour. Do you turn on the television set and see anyone encouraging you not to get AIDS by not being a homosexual? No. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Every time you turn on the TV, they have the media promoting that lifestyle. And in fact, recently, SB Bill 239 moved from a felony to a misdemeanor, intentionally infecting your partner with AIDS or with HIV. So instead of going to jail for three to eight years, now you only go to jail six months if they ever decided to prosecute. Now this isn't good for the people who have AIDS. This isn't good for their partners. They're self-destructing. And the people who are actually for this are the ones who are self-destructing. It's like they, they want to destigmatize the event even if it encourages the spread. But it's still self-destructive. And it doesn't just affect them. This is also if you intentionally go and donate uh, blood, infected blood. If you intentionally, not accidentally, if you intentionally donate infected blood. I don't know if any of you know who Isaac Asimov is. Isaac Asimov is one of my favorite science fiction authors. He's written hundreds and hundreds of books. I absolutely love him. He wrote the Foundation series. It's great. If you've never read it, you should go get it. It's, it's one of the best science fiction books of all time. He died in his mid-50s from a blood transfusion that was infected by the AIDS virus. I didn't know that until recently when I was doing some of this research. So unfortunately, it's not just those homosexuals who are infecting and killing or hurting themselves or their partners. It's also affecting others. Isaac Asimov is a perfect example. Now, even if you're not dying of AIDS, HIV medication over a lifetime, $379,668. This is according to the Center for Disease Control. This is so that you can put in remission the virus of HIV so that it's not supposed to infect the partners that you're with. But unfortunately, as I mentioned about two or three weeks ago when I was talking about people not taking their medication, three quarters of the people in our country don't take their medication correctly, which means they may think that they can't spread the disease, and in fact they still are. So, let's look at that number, 1,122,900. That's the number of people who currently are living with HIV, and 67% of them, according to this handout I just sent out, are homosexuals or bisexual men. So if you multiply 67% by that 1,122,000, you get 749,973. Now I put together something that I'll pass around. I'll keep one of these myself. Once again, I put together only three copies because I know most of you guys aren't going to read all of this. But 21% of homosexuals and bisexuals have HIV, 21%. And you can get to that figure by taking the 749,000 dividing by the number of male homosexuals in this country. 21%. Now, let me tell you something. I love kite surfing. I absolutely love kite surfing. I would love to go do it every single weekend if I could, if there was wind, if I wasn't working all six days a week in order to support my six children. 
But if 21% of the time that I went out to go kite surfing, I ended up with HIV, I can tell you I would never go kite surfing again, even if it's in my DNA, even if I was born that way. I'd be smart enough to say, I'm not going to risk my health and a lifetime of HIV and or AIDS just because I like kite surfing. That's a decision any of them can make also. What happens if you have HIV? The 19,000 deaths per year divided by the total number who have HIV of 1,122,000 is 1.7% of those who have HIV die each year. 1.7%. Now, that statistic doesn't mean anything until you compare it to what the average death rate is of the average American. That's 0.844%. So you're twice as likely to die once you have HIV as somebody who doesn't have it. It's a death sentence. In fact, you live, on average, 20 years less than somebody who doesn't have it. So, when I was going to Harvard, I was on the crew team. And one of the guys that I respected a lot was my coach on the heavyweight team as a freshman. His name was Ted Washburn. And he used to be a coxswain. He was a small guy. He was a, he was a little bit of a runt. He was probably the best speaker I've ever heard, the best motivator I've ever been around. He was like a father figure to me. I wanted to please that guy. He worked me harder than I've ever worked my entire life. And midway, after I finished his year and I was on the fourth boat and I was doing everything I possibly could to please him, but I just didn't have the height or the talent, but still managed not to quit or get fired. About six months after the freshman season, I found out that he had lost his job. He had lost his job because he had sexually molested one of his relatives. And we all probably should have known that because he had on the back of his car, I love Twinkies. He actually had that as a license, a bumper sticker on the back. And I didn't understand that, but I guess that's a slang term for little kids that are sexually molested by, by these types of people. And I was incredibly disappointed. I was heartbroken. And I actually had to do a lot of soul searching because I admired and respected this guy as much as I did. So we started off this conversation talking about these awful headlines of 300 pedophile priests in Pennsylvania. I didn't want to talk about this subject. I had something much more pleasant to talk about that everyone would have loved probably a lot more than the bludgeoning that I'm doing right now. I'm sure there would have been a lot less cacophony. I wouldn't have to worry about my car getting destroyed on the way out. Y'all would have liked me a whole lot better if I talked about something else. But I couldn't help it because 300 priests in Pennsylvania have been accused of child molestation. Do you guys know the number of priests in Pennsylvania? I had to immediately go find out. Thank God for Google. There's 2,500 priests in all of Pennsylvania. 300 of them have been accused of being child molesters over the last 30 years. Now, does that make sense that 12% of all the priests are actually child molesters? I couldn't, I couldn't understand that. I couldn't figure that out. So I had to go do some research because I'm a Catholic. I go to church every week. I'd like for my money to go to something other than payoffs to people who've been sexually abused by priests. And I wanted to figure out why this was happening. So if you look at this sheet, I went and found out there's 325 million people in the United States. 49% of them are men. The number of child molesters in the USA, according to calculations I was able to, uh, to see online, 747,000. Now here's something that's interesting. Nine out of 10 molesters are men. I recently talked to my wife and I said, you know what, we're looking at maybe buying a daycare center and you don't have the necessary qualifications. What do you think if I go back to school and learn about being, you know, take the courses so in case there's somebody who's sick, I can show up and I can teach them. She said, oh, absolutely not. Women would never drop their kids off with a man. And that's because women are smart. They know that nine out of 10 child molesters are men. And if you actually look at it, if you don't know the sexual orientation of a man, they are 0.004% likely to be a child molester, just your average man. That's one out of every 238. So that's not bad. One out of every 238 men are child molesters. 
Well, it's one out of every 2,380 women. You're 10 times less likely to have your child molested by a woman, which is why their instinct is never to, or to trust women 10 times more likely than men with their children. So whenever I get statistics like this, I always like to say, does that sound right? Because sometimes you can start doing these manipulations and find something that sounds like it doesn't compute. So you always want to try and figure out, am I going in the right direction here? Well, there's, this is going to be a little bit controversial, so I actually went and found three separate things that document this percentage. Gunderson Health says that 21% of all male child molesters admit having sex with boys under 16 years old. They're 21%. A Kinsey study, and we all know Kinsey liked to make himself feel better by overblowing the amount of sex he said everybody had, <laughs> but he says that 37% of the gays admit to having sex with underage kids. So we have between 21 and 37%. And here's the gay report that says 23% of gays admit to having sex with underage kids. So I took 23%. That sounded like on the low side. It was way below what Kinsey was saying. It was close to the 21%. So the total number of child molesters, male child molesters admitting having sex with boys under 16 is 154,713. Okay? Now you can take that figure and you can figure out what percentage of child molesters are gay and what percentage are not. And then you look at how many homosexuals and bisexual males there are in the United States. There's a very good source. These are self-admitted. 1.8% on the last census said that they were gay and 0.4% they were bisexual. So if you add those two together, there's 3,532,000 homosexuals and bisexual males in the USA and 154,000 of those are pedophiles. That's 0.043%. About 10 times more likely than the average guy is likely to be a homosexual. The gays are 10 times more likely to be child abusers. I looked at some other statistics which are indicated below. The Star posted the random confidential survey to 3,000 priests late last year, and 801 or 27% responded. The results showed that three quarters of those responding described themselves as heterosexual. 15% said they were homosexual and 5% bisexual. So the priests themselves are saying 20% of their number are homosexual. I computed maybe 40%, they're saying 20%. There's another statistic that is on the top side. Let me go ahead and read you this. The only hard data that has been made public by any denomination comes from John Jay's College Study of Catholic Priests, which was authorized and is being paid for by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops following a public outcry over the 2002 scandals. Limiting their study to plausible accusations made between 1950 and 1992, John Jay Research recorded that about 4% of the 110,000 priests active during those years have been accused of sexual misconduct involving children. That's a pretty high number. And if you look at the percentage of gay men who are child molesters, it's 4.3%. So they're saying 4%. If they were all gay, it would be 4.3%, so when you run the numbers, it makes it look like 80% of the priests are gay. So coming and saying that about 40% is probably splitting the difference between those two outliers. What is the point? The point is that the Catholic Church has abandoned its moral high ground. It's hurting and endangering not only the homosexuals themselves who are engaging in self-destruct behavior, but it's also hurting our children. And if we care about our children, we need to recapture that moral high ground, and stop victimizing the future children of America. Amen.